Chapter 19 of Outwitting the Hun, My Escape from a German Prison Camp by Pat O'Brien. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 I Am Presented to the King when the dreaded seventh of december arrived i hailed a taxicab and in as matter-of-fact tone of voice as i could command directed the chauffeur to drive me to buckingham palace as though i were paying my regular morning call on the king my friend's version of this incident i have since heard is that i seated myself in the taxi and leaning through the window said buckingham palace whereupon the taxi-driver got down opened the door and exclaimed threateningly if you don't get out quietly and chuck your drunken talk i'll jolly quick call a bobby blimey if i won't but i can only give my word that nothing of the kind occurred when i arrived at the palace gate the sentry on guard asked me who i was and then let me pass at once up to the front entrance of the palace there I was met by an elaborately uniformed and equally elaborately decorated personage, who, judging by the long row of medals he wore, must have seen long and distinguished service for the king. I was relieved of my overcoat, hat, and stick, and conducted up a long stairway, where I was turned over to another functionary, who led me to the reception room of Earl Cromer, the king's secretary. There I was introduced to another earl and a duke whose names I do not remember. I was becoming so bewildered, in fact, that it is a wonder that I remember as much as I do of this eventful day. I had heard many times that before being presented to the king a man is coached carefully as to just how he is to act and what he is to say and do, and all this time I was wondering when this drilling would commence. I certainly had no idea that I was to be ushered into the august presence of the king without some preliminary instruction. Earl Cromer and the other noblemen talked to me for a while and got me to relate in brief the story of my experiences, and they appeared to be very much interested. Perhaps they did it only to give me confidence and as a sort of rehearsal for the main performance, which was scheduled to take place much sooner than I expected. I had barely completed my story when the door opened and an attendant entered and announced, The King will receive Lieutenant O'Brien. If he had announced that the Kaiser was outside with a squad of German guards to take me back to Coutray, my heart would not have sunk deeper. Earl Cromer beckoned me to follow him, and we went into a large room where I supposed I was at last to receive my coaching but I observed the Earl bow to a man standing there and realized that I was standing in the presence of the King of England. "'Your Majesty, Lieutenant O'Brien,' the Earl announced, and then immediately backed from the room. I believed I would have followed right behind him, but by that time the King had me by the hand and was congratulating me, and he spoke so very cordially and democratically that he put me at my ease at once. He then asked me how I felt and whether I was in a condition to converse, and when I told him I was, he said he would be very much pleased to hear my story in detail. "'Were you treated any worse by the Germans, Lieutenant?' he asked, on account of being an American. I've heard that the Germans had threatened to shoot Americans serving in the British Army if they captured them, classing them as murderers because America was a neutral country and Americans had no right to mix in the war. Did you find that to be the case? I told him that I had heard similar reports, but that I did not notice any appreciable difference in my treatment from that accorded Britishers. The King declared that he believed my escape was due to my pluck and will-power, and that it was one of the most remarkable escapes he had ever heard of, which I thought was quite a compliment, coming as it did from the King of England. I hope that all the Americans will give as good an account of themselves as you have, Lieutenant, he said, and I feel quite sure they will. I fully appreciate all the service rendered us by Americans before the States entered the war. At this point I asked him if I was taking too much time. 
"'Not at all, Lieutenant, not at all,' he replied most cordially. "'I was extremely interested in the brief report that came to me of your wonderful escape, and I sent for you because I wanted to hear the whole story firsthand, and I am very glad you were able to come.' I had not expected to remain more than a few minutes, as I understood that four minutes is considered a long audience with the king. Fifty-two minutes elapsed before I finally left there. During all this time I had done most of the talking, in response to the king's request to tell my story. Occasionally he interrupted to ask a question about a point he wanted me to make clear, but for the most part he was content to play the part of listener. He seemed to be very keen on everything, and when I described some of the tight holes I got into during my escape, he evinced his sympathy. Occasionally I introduced some of the few humorous incidents of my adventure, and in every instance he laughed heartily. Altogether, the impression I got of him was that he is a very genial, gracious, and alert sovereign. I know I have felt more ill at ease when talking to a major than when speaking to the king, but perhaps I had more cause to. During the whole interview we were left entirely alone, which impressed me as significant of the democratic manner of the present King of England, and I certainly came away with the utmost respect for him. In all of my conversation, I recalled afterward, I never addressed the king as your majesty, but used the military sir. As I was a British officer and he was the head of the army, he probably appreciated this manner of address more than if I had used the usual your majesty. Perhaps he attributed it to the fact that I was an American. At any rate, he didn't evince any displeasure at my departure from what I understand is the usual form of address. Before I left, he asked me what my plans for the future were. Why, sir, I hope to rejoin my squadron at the earliest possible moment, I replied. No, Lieutenant, he rejoined, that is out of the question. We can't risk losing you for good by sending you back to a part of the front opposed by Germany, because if you were unfortunate enough to be captured again, they would undoubtedly shoot you. "'Well, if I can't serve in France, sir,' I suggested, "'wouldn't it be feasible for me to fly in Italy or Salonica?' "'No,' he replied, "'that would be almost as bad. "'The only thing that I can suggest for you to do "'is either to take up instruction, "'a very valuable form of service, "'or perhaps it might be safe enough for you to serve in Egypt. "'But just at present, Lieutenant, "'I think you have done enough anyway.' Then he rose and shook hands with me and wished me the best of luck, and we both said good-bye. In the adjoining room I met Earl Cromer again, and as he accompanied me to the door he seemed to be surprised at the length of my visit. "'His Majesty must have been very much interested in your story,' he said. As I left the palace a policeman and a sentry outside came smartly to attention. Perhaps they figured I had been made a general. As I was riding back to the hotel in a taxi, I reflected on the remarkable course of events which in the short space of nine months had taken me through so much and ended up, like the finish of a book, with my being received by His Majesty the King. When I first joined the Royal Flying Corps, I never expected to see the inside of Buckingham Palace, much less to be received by the King. End of chapter 19